Hey guys, I'm Seth Perkins from Bearded Butcher Blend Seasoning, White Feather Meats here in Creston, Ohio. And I'm Scott Perkins. We're picking up where we left off with the cleaning and dressing of our pig. It's a March day here on the farm. Seth and I grew up, as we sure many of you did, um, butchering pigs on the farm. Now we know that um, the wild game is probably number one on what you're gonna harvest out the back door. Number two is likely a pig. So today we're gonna be showing you with just the use of a knife and a handsaw, how to break down this pig. Um, you're gonna to wanna to stay tuned to the end of the video because we're gonna be doing grinding and we're gonna be stuffing sausage. So none of this pig is gonna be entering commerce. This is for family use. So if you're worried about the environment we're in or any of the practices, the beer nets are absent from this one because this is for family use. So let's get this pig off of the hook and get started breaking it down for you. Let's get started. All right, guys, so we're gonna get started on this pig. This is the hind quarter. This is the front, this is the shoulder. So we have a ham, we have a shoulder in between. We have the loin and we have the belly. So. Typically, I start with uh, the ham, and we're just gonna go ahead and start breaking this down. So if you remember from the dressing video, that's the what we call the leaf lard. If you're making pork lard, leaf lard is the most pure form. So if you're making it, um, especially for pastries, you're gonna wanna save just this portion. You can make lard, and we do make lard out of everything that you see, including the back fat. But this is the prized piece of lard right here. I like to start right here at the back of this belly. So that's making an incision right along the flank right here. Don't want to get into the tenderloin like you see here. So he stays right along the tenderloin. Then he's going to go ahead and break it with a saw. So you can see the angle of the H bone right here with the angle of the tailbone. We like to, to stay at, at a little bit of an angle in the direction of those two bones. You don't want to be over here. Um, you don't want to be too extreme with your angle. So just remember, whatever angle the H bone's going in is the direction of your saw. Simply make a cut through the tailbone, the end of that sirloin, and through that femur. I can use my 8 inch Victorinox breaking knife and we can just cut this ham off, cutting that little portion of that bone off of there. So right there, we'll do some further cutting on this, but you have a, a beautiful locally raised non-GMO fed pork ham that uh, can be cured and uh, smoked. So once we get that done, we're going to go ahead and just continue with the processing. What I like to do is split this. If you count your ribs, one, two, three, four, I like to go between the fourth and fifth rib. Make a little incision there if you'd like, just so you can remember what rib you're going to cut between. Take your hand saw. You want to stay nice and straight. You don't want to be getting angles. So go ahead and cut between the ribs and through the bone on the shoulder. Here again, I can use my eight inch breaking knife, simply cutting down through the meat. Right here is the end of the shoulder blade, neck bone, and there you have your pork shoulder. Now what we're going to do, and there's a couple different ways that you can do this. <clears throat> if you wanna do any Frenching on this loin, um, you actually need to start on the back and maybe I'll do that on the second one uh, and then peel this, this side off before you cut through the bones. But since um, this one, we're just gonna be doing some boneless pork chops. I'm gonna start here at the top. Take your knife, cut down till you meet the first rib bone and then stop. Simply take your handsaw, position it where you stopped with your knife and approximately two fingers or so from the, the bottom of this vertebrae is where you want your hand saw to be. Cut down through these rib bones until you feel those bones break. Then you take your six inch Victorinox semi-stiff boning knife and you simply cut down through there, removing that fresh side, which will turn into bacon. So as you can see, we've broke this uh, half a pig down into 
ham, shoulder, side, and loin. Now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started breaking each individual piece down. Starting with the loin first, I like to remove the back fat before I cut any chops. So starting at the end, I like to just pull the knife gently towards yourself. And as you can see, I am wearing chain mail. So this is an area where if your knife would slip, it can be extremely dangerous. So have the proper uh, attire on to avoid uh, an injury. So like we mentioned earlier, this fat's a little bit different than the leaf lard. Um, it can still be used for lard, but it just, it's not quite as clean tasting or pure as the leaf lard, but we certainly can save this and make pork lard out of it. Seth obviously with experience knows just what to take off of this to trim this up. Um, you know, obviously preference comes into play. If you want to leave more fat on your pork chop, you can certainly do that. In this case, we like to try to get it down to where there's a quarter inch or less of fat on each pork chop that's cut. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna break this loin down into boneless pork chops. Starting up here at the end, we're gonna peel this pork tenderloin out, staying as close to the bones as you can. You can just work this piece of muscle right out of that loin. We'll do a little bit of further trimming on here just to make it look nice get this unwanted fat and gristle off of off this tenderloin. As we mentioned in one of our earlier videos, it's nice if you're working with somebody that's working simultaneously to trim out the trimming so that way you don't have to come back through and do that all on your own. So I'm gonna be working through these trimmings as Seth breaks the carcass. So now that we have our tenderloin removed, we're gonna go ahead and work on the sirloin. Right here at this last knuckle on this sirloin, if you make a cut right down through here, you can meet right at this knuckle. And then you simply just twist that sirloin right off of there. So you can see we made a nice clean break. We're gonna go ahead and remove the sirloin. Now you could leave the bones in this if you'd like. Make like a, a, a bone in butt roast. Or you can remove the bones just like this, trimming it up, getting my eight inch breaking knife. We're gonna go ahead and cut some boneless sirloin steaks. You can, pork cutlets, you can do some stew, make a roast, whatever you'd like out of these. We're gonna leave them as a real nice boneless sirloin steak today. So there's the sirloin. We're gonna go ahead and make this loin boneless. So taking your fingers, holding the, the muscle here, slowly work your knife down along the back of these ribs. These ribs are your baby backs right here. So we're gonna go ahead and just slowly work this you can see I'm working my way right down along these bones. Once I get it down all the way to where I feel I'm hitting these bones, I like to flip it over. And then you just take your knife, run it right down along the back of this vertebrae. And you can peel this loin right out of there. So as you can see, we have a real nice boneless pork loin. Just gonna trim it up a little bit. So with this piece, maybe we'll cut it into a couple different options. You could do boneless pork chops. You could do butterfly chops. You could do a pork roast. Maybe we'll, uh, off this end here, We'll do a nice pork roast, and then we'll start cutting some boneless chops. Cut these about an inch thick. You can see they have real nice back fat on them. Real nice, evenly cut chop. Cut some of these. You can smoke this, cure it, smoke it, turn it into Canadian bacon. Now, 
Something else you could do is you can cut your boneless chops like this, or you can cut one that's about twice as thick as these. So you can go about twice as thick, and then you can flip it over, and you can cut it down through the back of this back fat, but not cutting it all the way through. And then you can make yourself a nice butterfly chop. So we'll cut a few of those here again, cutting down through the back, but not all the way through. Some nice butterfly pork chops. So there you have the loin on one side. We have our tenderloin, we have a roast, we have some real nice boneless chops, some sirloin steaks, and then our butterfly chops. Now we'll go ahead and get started on the fresh side. All right guys, so we're gonna get started on this fresh side, um, removing the spare ribs out of here and saving this awesome bacon or this fresh side we made into bacon. I like to start right on the inside of this uh, muscle, right, be, right on the, the back side of these spares. You can see, you don't wanna cut into the bones. You can actually see the bones right here. About an inch to an inch and a quarter below those bones, I like to make just to score the meat, but not cutting very deep. You don't wanna cut into your bacon. Once you have that score made, you can, there's a little chime bone there you wanna take out. You can take your knife, keeping it flat against these spares and you can peel these right out of this fresh side. This is where you want to be careful that you don't cut into this meat right here because that's going to be your your bacon. <clears throat> you certainly don't want to put a bunch of gashes in that. So there's the spare rib, there's the baby backs. I'll show you how we peel those down. We're going to go ahead and square this up. Removing a little bit of this uh, outside fat. The reason why we do this, the reason why we square it up here in our industry, um, a real nice, nicely squared bacon goes through our slicer real nice um, and there's very minimal waste. So you can see a real nice fresh side that's ready to go into the cure and then into the smoker. So there's our fresh side. Now let's go ahead and get started on the ribs. Baby backs, if you score through this membrane, right along this vertebrae, you can take your meat hook, you can hook right underneath this membrane, and you can peel that membrane right off of there. You wanna remove that. It's not real desirable to try to chew and eat, so get that off there. We're gonna take our knife, cutting through that meat there. And then we're just gonna take our hand saw and cut through these baby backs to the point where we can remove this portion. Doesn't make a very good rib. Now what we'll do is we'll take our hand saw cutting at the base of those ribs, peeling our baby backs out. Some real nice baby back ribs. These are our spares here again. We're going to score this membrane, hooking it with our meat hook. We can peel this membrane right off those spare ribs. Okay, that is the loin, including all of the ribs. Now we're gonna go ahead and get started on the shoulder. All right, we're ready to get started on this pork shoulder. So the beloved pork shoulder, pulled pork, Boston butt, picnic, this is where it's all at. So we're gonna go ahead and pull this neck bone out. You guys like bean soup? broth, making soup stock, this neck right here, that's a good thing to do it. Um, you can smoke this, this pork neck, cut it up into little pieces, add it to your beans, have some amazing, amazing soup beans. So now that we have that, that pork neck out of there, we're gonna go ahead and remove the jowl, starting up at this picnic end. 
you can cut this jowl off. Now today's application, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna trim this out into sausage trimmings. You can smoke that, make some smoke jowl, whatever you wish. So now we're gonna go ahead and flip the shoulder over. We are gonna take a little bit of this excess fat off the back of the shoulder. Um, for the cuts that we're gonna be doing, we don't wanna leave all this fat on here. You can if you want, it's whatever you'd like to do. But today we're gonna to be removing a little bit of that fat. Now that that fat's removed, I would like to show you right in the front of this shoulder where the neck would have been, there's a gland. So we like to get that gland out, just go ahead and remove it and discard it. So now, as you can see, we have a pork shoulder and in this pork shoulder um, where the blade is, this, this is the butt portion. Up here on this end, this is the picnic, the arm portion. So we're gonna go ahead Cut a couple roasts. First, cutting around this the shank here. Take my hand saw. Make a simple cut through that bone. Removing that pork cock. You can certainly save this. You can cut this in half, make it a bit, you know, a little bit more manageable, whatever you'd like. Perfect for beans, that sort of thing. So now that we have that cut off there, we're gonna go ahead and remove the rest of this picnic. It's always easier to cut through the meat and then get your saw out. So we're gonna go ahead and take this picnic portion off with our saw. So there we have our a pork picnic roast, you can cut this in half. You can um, make a smaller roast out of it. You can trim it out into trimmings. You can make sausage, whatever you'd like. You can cut it into steaks. If you had a bandsaw, you could cut it into some steaks. Today, um, I'm gonna leave it as a roast for now, but we're actually going to uh, trim that out into sausage here after a bit. Now that we have our picnic, you can remove this blade bone out of here. You can roll it, tie it, um, make a boneless roast. You can leave the bone in, whatever you, whatever you would like. All right, so now we're going to take this Boston butt. We're actually gonna be removing the blade bone in this. We're gonna roll it and tie it and make a real nice boneless butt roast that you could uh, hang in your backyard smoker, put it on your big green egg, put it in your Traeger, make some pulled pork. And what we like to do, we actually sell them like this in the shop, is we like to pre-season these with our original Beer to Butcher Blend seasoning. And that way, when you go to smoke it, it's ready to go. So you can see I'm working that shoulder blade bone out. Now it's been made completely boneless. I removed the gland out of here. I'm gonna take some strings some butcher twine and we're just going to tie this up and make it look pretty. As you can see I'm working my strings keeping them making them nice and tight. And the way you do these strings if you guys want to do some some tying like this if you make a, a loose knot as you can see my knots pretty loose there and then pull it tight. Once you get it tight, you can go ahead, make another knot, tighten that down, and that string's not gonna come loose. So that's a, that's a butcher's, butcher's knot. I'm gonna go ahead and keep putting some strings on here as we work our way down. The nice thing about putting a netting or a string on a, on a roast like this is it keeps the, the cut real nice and uniform so that when it cooks, it cooks evenly and it doesn't fall apart until you're ready for it to fall apart. That's why we like using a string or a netting. Then you simply, once you have it cooked, you can cut these off of there and the whole thing will just pull apart real nice.
now that I have some strings on there, take my eight inch knife, square it up a little bit. We're in the retail business, retail meat business, so everything's gotta look real nice and presentable. So now you can see we have a real nice butt roast. You can pre-season it, you can uh, cure it, you can smoke it, then you have cottage bacon, whatever you'd like. That's a real nice tide roast. We have a shoulder picnic, we have the hock. And now for this beauty right here, Scott's the ham master at White Feather Meats. He's gonna take over on this one. All right, time to deal with our ham. Now, we do our pigs skin off, skinless. We don't scald our pigs. Um, it's by far and large a lot easier if you're at home, especially if you don't have a scalding tank, you don't have to deal with putting uh, a fire under it. So this is gonna be skinless ham. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually make it boneless because that's how we prefer to do them here in our shop. So first thing we're gonna do is just go ahead and inside this H bone, what we would call oyster steak on beef, peel it out of there. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my, um, my thumb on my free hand, I'm just gonna kinda grab that muscle and I'll pull it back. And then I'll flip my knife and using an inverted grip, I'm gonna go right around this H bone, just work on my elbow a little bit. And once you've done that, you can, you can loosen up the H bone, try to get around here where you can see it. And you can pull that H bone right off of that ball joint, just like so. So now that I've done that, we've got a clear line right here where the muscle is that we can follow and we can, um, we can actually pull this right out of here. So what we're, we're gonna do is we're gonna take and we're gonna follow this line. We get down to about right here and you'll see I've, I've stayed between the muscle. We'll get down to about right here and we're just gonna turn our knife and we're gonna head for the table. We're not gonna call all the way through, but we're gonna break that joint right there. And I'll show you once we pull this around, knife goes back in the inverted grip and we stay right along this femur with the, just the tip of our knife now. And once we've done that, we're gonna find what is a natural seam following, following this sirloin tip right here. And once we've found that seam, we can work it all the way down and we can pull that out. So now I've taken and I've pulled out what we would call the sirloin tip. Now this makes a really nice roast so we'll set that aside and we'll get to that in a minute. At this point, what I'll do is I'll take my ham, just square it up just a tiny bit right there. And then if I put a little pressure right here, it's gonna pull this muscle around kind of in line where I want. And it's gonna take just a little bit of this off of here. Now for us, when we go into the smoker, we wanna take just a little bit of this fat cap off. Um, our customers don't, don't wanna buy a lot of fat, like Seth mentioned, we're in the retail business. So, and once again, anytime we remove something like this, it, it, it's, it goes into our, our lard rendering. So certainly not a waste. So we like to maintain that quarter inch of, of fat on a lot of our cuts, just so we're not asking the customer to pay for, for fat and they can appreciate that. So once we've done that, this ham would be ready for the smoker. And um, what you'll want to do is you want to put a couple of strings on here because you don't want this ham flopping around. So we'll set that off to the side for a minute and we'll show you this, this sirloin tip. Now what I'm going to do, is just use my free hand and pull up a little bit on this. Work this femur right out of here. You're going to have just like you would on a, a larger animal beef, you're gonna have a knuckle joint right there. So we'll just hold that nice and tight with our free hand, we'll get that. We'll square this up and we can just peel some of this excess fat right off of here. We've got a nice little tip roast grab my twine, go under this ham. Now I'm gonna start up at the top, the smaller, the smaller end of the ham, just so that way we have, uh, 
when we're holding this muscle, it pushes it down a little bit towards the, towards the larger end. Usually when you start that way, it keeps things from getting too far out of line. The reason we do this is it just keeps a, a nice uniform shape. And like Seth had mentioned, we want things to cook evenly. So when we go into our smoker, everything stays, stays together like we want it. A little trick you can use if you're worried about your string sliding, when you get down to the part of a muscle where it's getting towards the end, you can cut a little indentation there just to keep your string from sliding off the end. A little trick we like to use. Well, there you have it. We've got our boneless ham. We can hang this in the smoker and um, nice little sirloin tip roast. All right, guys, it's time to get started on the second half. We're going to do this one just a little bit different. We have the first half already cut, stacked up. We did a lot of boneless options, things like that, etc. So on this one, we're going to do some more bone in options. Let's get started. Similar to the first half, it begins the same way. Once again, cut along the flank, staying right along that tenderloin. Seth's gonna be using his bone saw to go uh, about an inch below that H bone, staying with the same angle, breaking that sirloin and ham. If you notice, he switched from his six inch Victorinox boning knife to his eight inch breaking knife. Sometimes with those larger primal chunks, it's a little easier to cut through there. So again, between the third and fourth rib, Seth's gonna cut through, break the shoulder. So hind, loin and bacon, and then shoulder at the end there. And really, we just wanna stress the fact that we're, um, we're doing this without the use of any power tools, all hand work. In fact, we're, we're in a barn that was built sometime in the late 1800s. So on this one, we want to do things a little bit different. Um, we cut the, the spares off right through here on the last one. Um, I want to show you guys how to do some, some long bone chops and some, some racks. So what we want to do is we want to start up here at this end of the loin and you want to wind up down here just past this little portion of the blade right here. So you want to make a mark, not cutting in your loin, and you want to go all the way across just like this. So you can go ahead and cut down until you hit those rib bones, cutting through this fresh side. Once you've scored that all the way down through, I like to take and go ahead and score this little piece just like we did on the last one, but you can see I'm doing it quite differently. Yeah, he's basically reversed it. And the reason why he's doing this is because um, he wants to make long bone chops, but not at the expense of the bacon. Uh, with a pig, obviously bacon is um, one of the, the top choices. And so he wants to peel this bacon off of these ribs. Now you're gonna be sacrificing a little bit of your spare rib to get the long bone but that's okay, it's easier to sacrifice spare rib than it is to sacrifice bacon. It's a little bit more difficult to do it this way, but it's very rewarding in the end. Once you get this bone out, you can see we're left with those log bones there. We have our fresh side being careful not to score into that meat. Here again, we're gonna go ahead, square up this fresh side for our bacon, just like this. Now we're likely gonna get asked the question about the smoking of the meats. Um, yes, we do smoke in um, our bacons and our hams. We do have a family recipe that we use that we are inclined not to share. And so we will, uh, 
we really don't have any intention to give away the trade secrets on our smoking other than there's a lot of different ways you can do your hams and bacons, including dry curing and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, we do smoke all of our hams and bacons that we take off of the pigs here at White Feather Meats. So as you can see, we have our long bones left on here. At this point, um, we're gonna go ahead and strip some of this fat off the back of the loin here. Okay, now that we have that fat trimmed off the back of that loin, we're gonna go ahead and just get started cutting this into some chops and some uh, French roast. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start right here at this last bone. I'm gonna cut down through here, just like that. Using my hand saw, make a simple cut. Barely had to cut through there, went right through. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve bones. The first four on here, one, two, three, four. We're gonna go ahead, cut these off like this. Now that we have this cut off, I'm simply gonna cut down alongside each of these bones cleaning out the meat in between them. This is where it takes, you know, a little bit more time for something like this, but the end result is definitely worth it. You can get real particular, you know, get these bones super clean, depends on how much time you want to spend on them. For the sake of our video, I'm going to get them pretty decent, but not as clean as I could. I think we're going to go ahead and cut this into three French chops, cutting down in between these bones, just like this. So if I had a bandsaw, this would be pretty easy because obviously I would just be holding them up against a bandsaw and zoop through there, but that's not the case. So we're doing this with a handsaw. So you guys make, you know, a $30, $40, whatever, you know, whatever style of, of handsaw you want to purchase, this is what you can be doing yourself at home too. Some nice French bone-in pork chops. Cut a few of them there. Get the nice long bone on them. Now with this, we're gonna go ahead, basically do the same thing, but we're gonna make a roast instead. You can make a crown roast by tying a couple of these together, bending them in a circle, tying some strings around them. But today we're just gonna make a a rack of pork. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel this membrane out on the inside of these rib bones. Taking my meat hook and just pulling this out. Okay, now that we have that portion done, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my hand saw. This can be a pretty challenging part, cutting these bones with a hand saw. Can be done. So just cut through here. Like that. Once we get those bones off, we're going to go ahead and remove the rest of these on the back. This is similar to a French rack of lamb. You can do a venison rack like this, whatever species you're looking for. Tomahawk chop on a beef or bison or elk. 
Okay, now that we have that done, I'm going to go ahead, actually just gonna take a little bit more of this fat off because I see I left it just a little bit long, but I didn't wanna get into that loin. Take a little bit more of that off. And then what I'll do is I'm gonna tie this with a few strings. Now you can just take your strings and you can go down through in between each bone And a project like this can get a little bit more time consuming. It's just all in what, how much time you want to spend producing, you know, whatever cut you wish. Um, as you saw in the first half, I just did the boneless chops and that went a lot quicker. So just, it's, it all depends on what style of cutting you want to do and how much time you want to spend on it. Whether you want to do this or not, it's up to you. Just wanted to show you a couple different options that you can do. So there you have just a rolled French rack. Maybe take your, your knife and just square those bones up a little bit. Get rid of those. French pork rack. Now we're gonna go ahead, take the sirloin. Going for that first knuckle again popping the sirloin off of here. So the last one we did boneless. Maybe this one you want to leave the bone in it. Do a bone-in sirloin roast. What we have left here are some bone-in chops. And here again, just cut a real nice thick chop. Grab your hand saw or you can use a uh, meat cleaver if you have one of those. As you can see, I'm kind of shooting for that little piece of cartilage in that vertebrae. That one's actually just gonna come apart. Some real nice bone-in pork chops. And these have the portion of the tenderloin right in them. Get down here to the end, there is a rib bone there, as you can see. I gotta stay away from that a little bit. Certainly, um, when you do a bone-in chop with, uh, with a handsaw, you know, some of your cuts aren't gonna be as pretty as they would be with a, with a bandsaw, but it, you know, it can be done. Um, you know, real nice thick bone in pork chop. Now moving on, we're going to do the shoulder and the ham. So come right back. All right, guys, now we're going to do another shoulder. And with this one, same thing, we're going to remove the, the neck bone out of here, cutting around this bone. Just remember, you can save it, cut it up, use it in soup beans, whatever you'd like. Just like this. Trying to stay as close to the bone as you can. Keep the meat on the cut, not on the bone. Now we're gonna pull this jowl off. Getting down to the end, we're gonna square it. Just like that, and remember, this is where we're gonna find that gland. Take the tip of your knife, pop that gland out. Just like that, get rid of it. Now we're going to remove the fat off the back of the shoulder. So with this one, I think we're going to do something just a little bit different than we did with the first half. Um, with the first one, we did the picnic and then we did the boneless butts. But with this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and cut this hock off of here just like this, cutting through the meat first because it's easier to cut through the meat with a knife and the bone with a saw. So go ahead and cut through the meat, grab our hand saw, 
cut through that bone. You have your hock, your shoulder hock. And with this portion right here, we're gonna go ahead and just leave this one whole. So you can smoke this entire pork shoulder and whether you're gonna be doing it in you know, your, your homemade smoker, your charcoal, your wood, your big green egg, your Traeger, whatever you wanna do, a whole bone-in pork shoulder, this consisting of the picnic and the butt. So there you have it, pork shoulder. This could also be boned out completely and put into your sausage grindings as well. So whatever you'd like, there's the different option with pork shoulder. And we'll go through all these cuts, we'll lay them out, and we'll explain everything to you once it's completed. Scott, off to the ham. So much like the pork shoulder, we've got the second ham here. In this case, I'm really not gonna do hardly anything with it. Um, just take and knock a little bit of the excess fat off simply because um, depending on how your, how your pig dresses out, in this case, our pig, if you remember from the cleaning and dressing video, which you haven't watched, you can find that on our channel. We had a 218 pound dress weight. So a pig of that size is gonna have a little bit of excess fat. So we're just gonna go ahead and trim that off. And because we're leaving this ham bone in, it's gonna be quite a bit larger than the last ham. So <clears throat> obviously you have to adjust your smoking times as needed based on whatever method you're using. We talk about smokers a lot. In the old days, of course, you had um, dry curing, stuff that was a little bit more popular down south. And then you had um, the smoke houses that were kind of home built on the farm. And today you have smokers that are wildly popular and there's many different ways that you can do it. Tons of recipes, whether you want to brine or leave your ham. So in this case, we're just going to hang this ham up. And we have a bone in ham and a boneless ham. So as you're working through your pig, you're obviously going to have cuts that you're not going to um, do anything other than make them into your trimming. So we've covered in our trimmings video some of the particulars, but I just wanted to go over with you again as you work through the trimmings pile or if you're doing this simultaneously with um, another party doing the trimming while you're doing the cutting, which is what we like to do. We're just taking excess fat, glands, bloody, uh, any blood vessels that we find out of the trimmings before we grind them up into our sausage. That just gives you a nice product in the end. For the, the grinder that we're gonna be using today, I like to have pieces that are somewhere right in the golf ball size range. Seems to work out best for working them through there. We're gonna go over those details when we get our grinder set up. But anything that has the glands and the bloody neck meat you wanna get rid of. Obviously, bones do not belong in the grindings as well. So something like this hock, you just wanna stay right along the bone, using your free hand to pull away on the muscle as you work that off the bone. The hock being one of the more difficult pieces. And also a piece where you're gonna have the gristle just because of the nature of the anatomy of the animal where that works. So as I've instructed in my other videos, we like to do um, take as much of the muscle and the gristle off of the bone all at one time, and then just look through your, your trimming, make sure that you don't have any gristle left in it. Add that to your trimmings pile. And once we've got a nice blend, we can move on to making our sausage. With pork, we don't get as, much, as concerned about the amount of fat that's in it. We typically like a, a decent amount of fat in our pork. So when we do our cuts, we, we often trim that excess fat, the cover fat away. And that means when we do our trimmings, we really don't have to take any more fat out of it just make it up into some nice cubes. Pull any of the nasty bits that you wouldn't want in your sausage and get started grinding your sausage. 
I want to show you guys um, what we have out on, you know, on our table right here. Starting at this end, we have a, a nice pork tenderloin, some country style ribs. These are our boneless chops cut about an inch to an inch quarter thick. We have some boneless butterfly chops here. We have some sirloin steaks, and this is all off of one loin. Um, we do have the bone in option of the sirloin right here. It's a sirloin butt roast. You can cut these into steaks as well and have the bone in option instead of the bone, boneless option, it's up to you. Moving on to the second loin that we did, we have bone in chops. You can see we have some real nice thick bone in pork chops. They do have that, that tenderloin right in them. Um, so just remember, if you have a hog processed and you want boneless loins, you would get your tenderloin, but if you do a bone in option, your tenderloin is gonna be tucked right in that bone in chop like a porterhouse steak. So those are our bone in chops. Here we have a bone in chop with a nice long bone on it, more of a tomahawk style. Um, these are the, the ones that are cut into chops. This one's left as a roast, so you can see we have a, a real nice French pork roast option here. Moving down this direction, this is our pork shoulder. This one has the picnic end and the butt end on it. You can leave this as a roast, you can cut it into steaks, you can put it in your trimmings, whatever you'd like. We do have a pork hock here, you can leave it whole, you can cut it in half, smoke it, add it to your bean soup. We have a, a picnic, picnic roast. We have a uh, sirloin tip roast out of that first ham that Scott did, the boneless, the semi-boneless one. We have our uh, shoulder butts that are rolled and tied. You can use these as a roast. You can make cottage bacon, cottage ham, whatever you like with those. We have our fresh sides. These will be our bacon. We have one off each side, so we have two of those. We have our spare rib, and we have our baby back. Now remember, on that second half, we did use, um, we kind of, forfeited our ribs in a way um, to leave the bones on these cuts right here. So that's why you're only gonna see one set of spares and one set of uh, baby backs. And we also have hanging up here, we have a semi boneless ham and we have a bone in ham. So that is the entire pig cut up and on the table here at Bearded Butcher Blend Seasoning. And we also have what's coming up next. And out of this pig, we have about 25 to 30 pounds of trimmings. We're gonna show you how to make some pork sausage. If you wanna increase the amount of sausage trimmings, um, you could simply take any of these items that you would not want as we cut it, simply bone it out, putting it into your trimmings is gonna increase your sausage. So something to keep in mind. Stay tuned, sausage is coming next. All right, so it's on our trimmings pile. We're working, it's, it's March here, and there's a reason why butchering was always done in the fall or the spring. We're in optimal temperatures. I think we're at 39 degrees today. So it's always nice to have nice chilled meat. We've also worked through this pile and we've got everything broke down. For the size of grinder that we're using, um, so three quarter horse grinder, we like to have pieces, you know, like I mentioned, a golf ball. And so we'll just start working it through here and um, we're gonna be grinding right into the lug. Whenever you're making sausage, we like to do about 25 pound batches at a time. There's a lot of recipes that are formulated per pound or for per, per 25 pounds. So today we're gonna be doing a 25 pound batch. Uh, for the sake of this video, we're just gonna be demonstrating the grinding. So I don't have any seasonings in this. If you were gonna be making sausage out of this, you'd be putting your seasonings into your trimming before grinding. That's gonna help it blend really well if you add the seasonings prior to grinding. All right, so one of the things we know about these grinders, they don't like to start dry. So when you are going to start grinding, go ahead and get a little something going in there. That way when your grinder starts off, it has a little bit to get going. We'll flip it on and get started with our grinding. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is start dropping pieces in here. Um, like we mentioned about golf ball size. Now the grinder doesn't always like to, to run dry, so we like to get a piece in there and get started before we even flip it on. Now you're gonna have your plunger. What I like to do is just put a pile up here in my hopper, start walking it, working it through. Um, if you work these things too fast, they like to kick back on you, so 
It's a lot smarter just to work through little portions at a time. Try not to let your grinder run dry. Now, a question you might get asked is, or we might get asked is, what size of grinder plate we should be using. This is a number eight. If you don't like how your grind is looking, you can always grind it a second time. Sometimes what you can do is first grind through a coarse plate and then through a fine plate. Obviously there's a lot of different grinders on the market. As I mentioned, this is a three quarter horse grinder. Definitely one of the nicer sizes for home butchering and it's gonna make short work of our trimmings pile. If you happen to notice that your grinder doesn't seem to be performing at the correct speed, definitely check your power source. Depend on the size of your grinder, it's gonna take quite a bit of juice to run it. And if you have it hooked up to an extension cord and you have a long run, you might find that your grinder isn't even barely turning because of that. So if you're having any issues with your grinder, make sure you check your power source. Probably goes without saying, but you definitely want to keep your fingers out of your grinder, or at least I'm sticking them down in. That's what you have a plunger for. As you can see, as I work this down, and I kind of, I've referred to it as the, the cat pawing method. If you just kind of swat it down into the grinder opening, it will take it at a certain rate and you won't overwhelm the grinder. You won't plug up the grinder. I've only used my plunger once or twice since I started about halfway through my pile. All right, there we have it. In just about five minutes, my grinder never plugged, and never hit reset, and I have a beautiful pile of grindings. Now we can get on to stuffing and casing our sausage. All right, guys, we're gonna go ahead and start loading our uh, hand crank stuffer, and we're gonna show you how to make some sausage. This is where it's nice if you have a buddy, um, just because he can hang on to this. Um, we're gonna be using a hand crank. This is uh, more or less a commercial one in the sense that it's a bit bigger than the home user models that are out there. However, it's the very same principle. Yeah, this is a, this is a stuffer made by F. Dick. They are available. Um, you, you can find them on Craigslist, eBay, and you can pick them up. You know, you might, you might even find one for a hundred bucks, so keep your eye out for one of those. Now, Scott mentioned earlier when he was grinding this sausage that, you know, it's 39 degrees here in Ohio. And as I'm loading this into our stuffer, I can tell you that the temperature on this, on this sausage is still way below 45 degrees. It's probably closer to, you know, 42, 43 degrees going into this stuffer. Now that our stuffer's full, we'll go ahead and load it up and start making sausages. All right. Sausage loaded up in the stuffer. It's time to put our casing on. Now we're gonna be using a collagen casing. These are a lot easier to use than a natural casing just because um, they're pretty much shelf stable. You can buy them. A lot of different uh, suppliers are gonna have these. And um, the, the, the disadvantage to these is that you cannot twist them, but you can link them or you can make coils, whichever's your preference. So just a little tip, when you start running your stuffer down, there is a, an air release valve right here. 
Um, you do want to periodically push this down, release some of that air out of there because what, what's going to happen is, is you're going to fill your casings with more air than you are sausage. So um, just give it a little push, let some of that air out. I'm just going to coil these up for the sake of the video. Seth just went ahead and tied the end of this off. We did not have to C-clamp this down to the table because of the size of this and the meat that's in it, loaded it up. Um, sometimes if you have a hand crank stuffer, you might have to put it, fix it to the table with a C-clamp. As you can see, we're making pretty short work out of our sausage. So in this case, I'll just go ahead and dump it into our lug. We're running out of room on the table. And there you have it. Nice tub of great looking pork sausage. Um, I'll go ahead and dump these out and show you if you are going to be linking these, where you, what you kind of want to look for in, in terms of length. Usually it's with your thumb, your fist and your thumb, that's going to give you a, just about the right size. You want to link these up. This will be about four. This will be make about four to a pound of a of a really nice linked sausage. It's really fun here. You can do a lot of different flavors. You can get the high temp cheeses if you want to put that in. You want to do about 10% if you do high temp cheeses. If you um, you want to get any fresh vegetables, um, spinach leaves, some portobello mushrooms, you can add that stuff in at about a 10% rate. And you're going to get some really great tasting, beautiful pork sausages. One of the things that we grew up eating on our farm was the pork sausage that our dad and grandfather made. And that's why you'll find us doing what we're doing today. Now, a lot of people, Scott mentioned about the twisting of the ends of these sausages. Um, when you fry these up or when you grill them, they tighten up real nice inside these collagen casings, um, and they, the, as far as twisting these, you know, we found that there really isn't um, isn't a need because the way that that collagen casing holds them in there makes a perfect perfect sausage. So now that we've made more of the dinner style sausage with the 32 millimeter collagen, we're going to be doing some of the breakfast sausage, which is a 21 millimeter fresh collagen casing. Typically, we find that when you're doing the dinner type sausages, you might want to be doing more of your Italians, um, that sort of thing with the breakfast. That's where you want to do your sage, your salt and pepper, your country style, etc. It's just a matter of a different size casing coming through this stuffer, and you get a, just a little bit different feel to your sausages. Same, same scenario. You get these all stuffed out and you can start, you, you might want to make these just a, a, a slight bit smaller. The kids are going to love these, something that fries up really nice. You can do about eight of these to a pound, give you a pound. And there's just an idea of the comparison if you want to do your 32 millimeter collagen beside your 21 millimeter fresh collagen. Now the other thing you can do is you can certainly leave some of your pork sausage in bulk as well. So if you want to make some bulk sausage, you want to make uh, sausage gravy and biscuits, you know, handmade patties, um, that sort of thing, you can go ahead and leave some of it in bulk. The cool thing about this is you can get the family involved, um, make a fun day out of it. You know, this has been just a couple of hours. Obviously, you know, this is what we do for a living. So we probably make it look a lot easier than it actually is. Um, get a good knife, visit our, our website. You can get one of these Forstner, uh, I'm sorry, the Victorinox uh, six inch boning knife. You can um, get our, our honing steels, uh, that sort of thing. You can get our bearded butcher blend seasonings. You can mix those into your sausages, your brats if you'd like, but just make it a family event. You know, pick a nice cool day, 
get out there, get your pig cut, get your deer cut, your beef, your bison, elk, whatever, um, and you can really, really enjoy the benefits of eating something that you harvested, you cut, and feed it to your family. Thanks for watching. This one's been a lot of fun being down here on the farm, just like we grew up as kids. This is something that, like Seth mentioned, you can get everybody involved. It's a lot of fun. Pigs are a lot easier to grow. Livestock, throw it in your backyard. Um, so that's why we want to bring you a pig cutting video. Once again, subscribe to stay up to date with the Beard of Butchers. I'm Scott Perkins along with Seth Perkins, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.